Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Bark Me This. Wah 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 animal's name. Wah 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 wah. We've all seen Charlie Brown, and remember how the adult speech makes no sense? Well, that's likely the same experience that our favorite pooches and kittens have when we speak to them. But it won't anymore. With Bark Me This, we'll teach you how to speak dog, cat, horse, pig, or whatever other animal you have, uh, so that it's not them understanding you, but them understanding you. Informed by evolutionary psychology, functional imaging methodology, and veterinarians, we've cracked the animal code, and now you can too. For just 10 easy payments of fifty nine ninety five, you can crack the animal code and bark, meow, oink, whinny, or anything else your way into your favorite animal's hearts and minds. Mention keyword engage brain and receive one payment credit. Are humans special? There's no consensus on this question of what makes us special, or whether we even are. With regard to our brains and minds, the biggest point of contention is whether our cognitive abilities differ from those of other animals, in kind or merely in degree. In other words, are we completely separate, or are we just the smartest animals around? In the Memory, Learning, and Self episode, I commented on how my two areas of research, memory and language, are ripe with claims of human superiority. But there's this ever-moving demarcation line that separates man from beast. Today, sit down with Jay Cologne to talk about humans, language, thought, and evolution. to go solo uh, and don't have amazing guests uh, to come in and speak about uh, different fun things in neuroscience and the brain and uh, I think we get to end on a really interesting topic uh, looking at uh, what makes humans special uh, right uh, so the uh, I wish you luck in the future with your podcast <laughs> yeah, uh, first off <laughs> um, but yes taking a look at this topic that I have here mm-hmm. it's um, I want to take a look at the various differences between humans and other primates in behavior, the biological makeup of the brain, and so on. Um, At first it looked as if I were going to stick with a distinct focus on language, but since then the topic sort of expanded and evolved. Uh, Interestingly, my research is coming, uh, as my research is coming to a close, it looks like I'm moving back into this familiar territory of the language capabilities of both humans and primates, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, your research has kind of followed the normal organic uh, path of not going the way that you originally planned. <laughs> right. Um, uh, again, it's uh, sort of taken a life of its own. Mm-hmm. Uh, at first, my sole interest was this idea of sentience. Uh, in, well, really, what makes a being sentient? Uh, This stemmed from several other classes I'm taking Mm -hmm. um, in both psychology and philosophy. uh, And being able to take a look at the biology of the brain as well really does help uh, try to uh, separate things into neat categories Mm -hmm. in order order to sort of define it uh, in a scientific sense. Yeah, and you, I th- think I remember you saying that you were particularly interested in kind of th- things, animals, and humans at the fringe. So you mentioned the case of like uh, Jenny, or Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie. Jeannie. Uh, and then uh, how she had kind of problems with language, and then you look at primates with some sort of language. Uh, so where's that boundary between them? Right. Uh, uh, I actually, in my research, I. S- um, As I said before, I sort of had strayed away from that and then Mm -hmm. came back to this as things went on. So taking a look at, as you say, uh, these fringe cases Mm -hmm. of both uh, Coco the gorilla, who seems to be uh, uh, a gorilla who's 
far exceeded our expectations as far as language has gone, uh, learning sign language and being able to utilize it. Uh, for example, uh, uh, going back to this idea of what makes a sentient being, it used to be uh, whether a primate can, or an animal in general, can uh, have an understanding of language and use language. It was then moved when it was, uh, this line was moved when it was discovered that uh, primates actually can learn uh, rudimentary uh, sign language. Uh, and it was actually moved to uh, being able to make new language which was again moved when it was discovered that Coco the gorilla in particular, or uh, her mate Michael, uh, was able to create different compound words to d define new, uh, new words and new experiences that they've never run into. So for example, being able to combine the words for finger and bracelet to mean ring. Mm -hmm. Uh, nowadays, the uh, line for sentience has m uh, moved to having a theory of uh, the mind mm -hmm. uh, being able to express this. It uh, did go in a, into a transitionary phase in which it, uh, sentience was being able to have a theory of the self as well as language. Okay. And that, again, moved when it was discovered that animals can recognize themselves in mirrors, mm -hmm. uh, showing that they n uh, have an idea of... Uh, there, um, there's this physical presence that is me, mm -hmm. and then there's this other presence that represents me. Yeah, yeah, I like the test that they do for that. One of the tests where they put the dot on the, their face and then show them the mirror, and they try to <laughs> wipe it off. Right, exactly. It's uh, that sort of thing that, uh, uh, again, this idea of sentience has been used to uh, emphasize human superiority over mm -hmm. the uh, animal world and uh, seeing as how inconsistent uh, the definition has been over the years it's really interesting to see how exclusionary we are it's not a matter mm -hmm. of making things scientific it's a matter of making sure we're always one step ahead yeah yeah it, I, I'm gonna butcher the analogy but uh, how uh, if you're gonna measure uh, someone's ability to do something and you take a fish and give them a uh, tree climbing uh, a test, uh, yeah, they're going to fail at that, uh, but uh, that's because you're right. giving them the wrong test. Uh, you're moving the goalposts yeah. um, to fit your needs, and that's really the main problem here, which I think uh, is why this uh, it's important to look at these fringe cases mm -hmm. of both Genie and Coco. Uh, going back to Genie a bit... Um, uh, Genie is a very famous example of uh, what's known as a feral child, uh, putting that in air yeah. quotes. Um, these, uh, these feral children are those who have grown up uh, in such a way that they were, they were not socialized as nor uh, standard humans were. Um, and thus, uh, in the case of Genie, she never... Uh, throughout her critical period in learning language, she never gained the first language. She, uh, unfortunately, had suffered quite a bit of uh, neglect, uh, abuse, and was confined such that uh, uh, she, even her mobility was hampered. Uh, when she was finally rescued, um, she was uh, taught language, she was able to recover. However, her language skills were quite different than how most people... Uh, start to learn language. Uh, she was able to learn vocabulary much faster than most people in her uh, stage of language development uh, are able to learn language. However, uh, her uh, use of grammar was severely impaired, and she never truly did get uh, a sense of how to use grammar properly. Um, and in fact, uh, later in life, uh, throughout uh, more... <laughs> Jeannie is a very sad story. Yeah. Um, throughout uh, her later life, she suffered m even more abuse, and she later lost the uh, capacity to uh, use language entirely. Mm. Um, and that's actually the current state in which she is in. She does not speak. Um, whether or not she's lost this, as I had said, that's probably yeah. the wrong way to phrase it, or simply is not using her capabilities. That's... Uh, that's a very fine line, especially as right now we don't really know. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's an impossible thing to measure in almost anyone. Uh, so what is your language capability if you're not willing to communicate with me? Right, and which is why I started taking a look at different biological um, processes of the brain, things mm -hmm. of the sort, and uh, taking a look at Jeannie, when tests were done on her brain, it seems as if she... Uh, uh, brain scans showed that she had a perfectly uh, standard brain. Uh, mm -hmm. It was f uh, fully functional. Um, she just developed differently, and thus uh, the way she used her brain was different. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, she was. Um, uh, she, it was once thought she, that she was uh, right brain dominant um, because of this. Uh, impairment in language, but as it turns out, uh, uh, it was discovered that no, she was indeed left brain dominant. Her The left brain just took different capacities during her life through plasticity and things of the sort. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you take someone in a critical period and don't give them the thing that that critical period needs, kind of the nourishment, and their brain develops a little bit differently. Right, and uh, once again, moving on to the biology of things, um, and taking a look at the brains of different primates uh, and seeing how they evolved in order to fit uh, their needs as far as, well, uh, I don't want to say society because that is a term almost exclusively used for humans, mm -hmm. but uh, the way that uh, several different uh, primate culture, uh, the culture of uh, primates such as chimpanzees, uh, the way that works is... Um, it, they're very group oriented uh, so in a sense they're almost like humans and when taking a look at the brain uh, it's shown that their brains are again very similar to ours mm -hmm. uh, they just uh, they simply don't uh, propor when proportional to size their brains are just not as large mm -hmm. um, we happen to have hit the jackpot there yeah. evolutionarily um but, uh, in fact, speaking of evolution, it seems that it's uh, uh, we are starting to see, uh, being able to observe the effects of that uh, as we speak. Um, chimpanzees, in particular, have uh, entered, uh, according to a study by PNAS, mm -hmm. um, they have entered the Stone Age, chimpanzees have. Uh, which no other primate really has. Mm -hmm. This was seen um, because uh, these chimpanzees were able to create and successfully use stone tools in a um, without being exposed to it through human contact. Mm -hmm. uh, these chimpanzees uh, were uh, ex uh, were uh, excluded from human contact. So it's def it's we're sure that this was not uh, merely a case of imitation. Mm -hmm. Um, they actually have been able to uh, undergo this, which is uh, surprising in some ways, and yet uh, we do know that evolution is uh, something that naturally occurs. However, seeing as chimpanzees, uh, as opposed to other primates, are one step ahead, that does put them in a distinct gap between other primates and ourselves. Yeah. So, uh, going forward, uh, it's probably important to see what's different between, uh, in society, uh, the social customs of chimpanzees as opposed to other primates and ourselves, as well as the biology of, uh, of the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder if it's not, some people kind of think language as a driver for particular brain development. I wonder if they're in chimpanzees, we might be seeing a different behavior that's driving their brain evolution. Uh, right. Uh, this idea of language, um, I, again, uh, this is sort of why my research has focused on language. Mm -hmm. um, that does seem to be the barrier. Uh, humans do have the uh, distinct uh, advantage to having uh, vocal cords that allow us to right. Uh, s speak as we do, as opposed to merely barks and yelps, mm -hmm. uh, which other primates are limited to. Um, however, it, uh, studies have shown that uh, even these um, barks and yelps have different meanings mm -hmm. uh, for different uh, primates, and they're able to communicate in that way, limited as they are. Yeah. 
Uh, so trying to see the difference between that and our own language is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the complicated coordination of the vocal cords and then all of the dedication, like musculature dedicated to moving vocal tracts and uh, your tongue and uh, lips around. <laughs> right, it's, um, it's uh, interesting to see, uh, see uh, seeing as we're sort of drawing this line uh, once again, uh, sort of ex in an exclusionary way, um, see especially seeing as even if we were to uh, uh, take a look at things through the lens of language, uh, primates are simply don't have the physical capabilities of speaking as we mm. do. Um, so we're comparing apples to oranges here, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, we're kind of we've been going around uh, this topic in different ways. Do you think that there's any one really important thing uh, that you want to mention about uh, about your research, or something that's a uh, confusing point that you want to try to clear up? Well, to be honest, that really does go into the biological aspects of the brain. It's really hard to uh, sort of explain in detail. Um, these uh, different biological processes and the uh, taking a look at the make and the makeup of the brain without uh, delving into well this study says X and, and this study says Y uh, it really is this comparative thing that uh, and we are constantly learning more such that at this stage uh, even with the research I've done you can't really narrow it down to one thing uh, this difference between humans and other primates. It really is a combination of a language, biology, culture. Yeah, and, and that's amazing considering how similar the DNA is amongst the species. Exactly, uh, which is uh, why, uh, going back to these fringe cases, uh, the, uh, the example of Genie is so fascinating. I don't think anybody in the world would say that Genie is not a sentient being. Mm -hmm. However, I do also feel that many people will just say that Coco the gorilla is not, right. even though Coco the gorilla, at this point in time, actually has more language capabilities than... Expresses more. Expresses more, let me go um, back, yeah. uh, is able to express more mm -hmm. than Genie, although Genie arguably does have the capabilities, uh, which... And then goes into a long philosophical debate <laughs> right. as far as in order to be sentient, does one have to merely uh, have the capacity to do something, or does one actually have to step over the line and do it? Yeah, and to go in a completely random direction that we'll say for a different podcast, uh, we're about ready to uh, give sentience to artificial intelligence, and so we're just <laughs> going to skip animals completely and say, these robots and these computers have intelligence, humans have intelligence. This is a subject I've looked into myself, and it is absolutely fascinating that uh, seeing as we once uh, saw that robots and um, these created and uh, created beings as evolutionarily air quotes here evolutionarily uh, placed before animals, uh, it was once thought that these aren't. Uh, real beings, they are merely programmed to react in certain ways, and to which some have argued, well, what's the difference between that and actually creating life? Uh, and that does have its place in science, however, it is more of a matter of uh, for philosophers at this current point in time, uh, especially seeing as we can't look at the biological processes of a computer. Right. Yeah, so I think we're kind of running low on time, so uh, I thought we talked before uh, the show that you had something going on at, at noon here, so uh, would you like to uh, talk about uh, the uh, new group that you started on campus? Oh, right. Um, well, uh, here on campus I have started a chapter of Young Americans for Liberty. It is a uh, organization that spans uh, several hundred colleges across the United States. Uh, it's a libertarian organization which uh, focuses on different uh, subject matter, 
Uh, we are currently uh, engaging in free, uh, this idea of free speech, and uh, so we actually have a project uh, going on, as you stated, at noon today, uh, for a free speech ball to be rolled around campus, uh, 12 foot in diameter, uh, letting anybody write on it. Uh, there's also going to be a movie screening on Sunday looking at the uh, where free speech and comedy collide. Mm. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll let you get out to the, the free speech ball. <laughs> thank and you. I really appreciate your uh, taking the time to come and talk about it. Fascinating time. Thank you very much. I wish you luck in the future. So thanks so much to Jay for coming in. I really appreciate it. A really interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, looking to wrap up uh, the podcast, two segments here. Uh, the first, scholar notifications. Uh, I had just uh, received a notification the other day uh, from a, a journal I'd never heard of, Applied Neuropsychology Adult. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, maybe a new uh, journal or maybe just something that uh, I haven't come across before. Uh, but in the uh, journal, they have a, a brand new research uh, article, Neuropsychological Assessment of Hippocampal Integrity. Uh, and uh, coming from uh, authors uh, Jean-Michael Sari and Ingrid Emanuelson, it was published online just uh, about a week ago uh, in 2016 here. Uh, and what they've found is uh, using methods to describe subcortical processes assisting cognition uh, is an important concern for clinical neuropsychological practice. And in the study, they reviewed the literature concerning the relationship between neuropsychological instruments and the underlying neural substructure. So they examined uh, evidence indicating one of the oldest neuropsychological tests still in use, the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test, or the RAVLT, uh, includes reliable indicators of hippocampal integrity. Uh, so they reviewed studies investigating the neural structures underlying seven tasks generated by the RAVLT from the perspective of whether the performance of these tasks is dependent on the hippocampus. And they found support for their hypothesis in five of those cases, uh, that learning capacity, proactive interference, intermediate, uh, I'm sorry, immediate recall, delayed recall, and delayed recognition. Uh, there wasn't support for their hypothesis found with regard to short-term memory and retroactive interference. Uh, so the RAVLT, one of the, again, one of the oldest a neuropsychological test still in use appears to be a reliable tool for assessing the integrity of the hippocampus and for the early detection of dysfunction. There is a need, however, for assessments due to the critical role of hippocampus in cognition, for instance, in terms of predicting future outcomes, uh, in particular for uh, outcomes of uh, neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, so an uh, uh, interesting article from a journal that I've uh, never seen before, possibly a, a new one, maybe just one that I just for whatever reason haven't come across, uh, but that was Neuropsychological Assessment of Hippocampal Integrity in the journal Applied Neuropsychology Adult. And then uh, wrapping up the show with the last segment, reader mail or Twitter tweets, jumping over to uh, my mailbox here, uh, I haven't seen anything uh, in uh, the engagebrainpodcast at gmail.com uh, mailbox. Uh, also, nothing over on Twitter at Engage Brain on Twitter. Uh, but I'm hoping to get something soon because uh, this is uh, currently the last uh, podcast on the docket uh, that uh, I have planned. Uh, so I'll have to start thinking uh, later this afternoon um, or tomorrow over the weekend uh, about future episodes uh, where I don't have a uh, revolving door of uh, interviews to uh, conduct. Uh, so it would be great to receive some questions or suggestions uh, from any audience out there uh, with uh, ideas for things that I should talk about or uh, ask other people about. Uh, so you can re reach me at EngageBrain on Twitter or at EngageBrainPodcast at gmail.com with any questions or suggestions. Uh, so thanks so much. This has been the EngageBrain Podcast. Thanks for listening. Very control.